Okay, there we go. Yeah, well, welcome on in. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. Uh, I think there's a lot to cover. There's a lot going on in the market. There's a lot going on in the macro. And um, there's a lot to get into. And I say, uh, let's not waste a minute. Let's get right to it. So as people kind of come in, uh, I guess I'll give you a little bit more of a, of a background on me personally. Um, I've been investing since about 2014. And I really got into gold and silver uh, because of Ron Paul, actually. Um, I was really big into him in my early 20s. And he really introduced me to the Federal Reserve, the entire monetary system. And he really actually even helped me uh, realize a lot about the media itself. I mean, his entire election campaign really woke me up to a lot about the, how the world works. And part of that specifically was gold. Um, because in my mind, in my eyes, I see gold as a bit of a white rabbit, especially in finance. Because once you start tracking gold, once you really get into gold, uh, you go down that rabbit hole. And inside that rabbit hole is a whole new world uh, really gets lost in our entire education system. I mean, you learn about central banking. You learn about the history of money and fiat and empires and fallen nations and, and how everything works and interest rates and monetary policy and fiscal policy and you get into war and fear and debt and GDP and growth and M2 and all kinds of things you probably wouldn't have learned about otherwise. And it's for this reason that I really love gold. Gold opens up the conversation to everything. Gold's connected to everything. Gold is money. Gold is the bedrock. And, uh, you know, you might even make the argument that gold itself is macro. It is the macro. And while oil is critical for output and growth, oil costs money and gold is money. And that kind of makes gold the chief cornerstone in the commodity complex. And so I love gold. It is probably my single favorite most commodity. And I, I've been invested for a long time. I look forward to buying more on these uh, reduced prices here. And I can't wait to talk about it. Alex, how you doing today, buddy? Excellent. And, um, you know, kind of, uh, I know there's some uranium people here, but um, we do these with uranium also. And uh, Liberty is always jumping in. And kind of one of the things that came up is, why don't we have one of these with gold or silver? And we don't. So somebody's got to push the button. Somebody's got to, you know, say, hey, let's do it. So, um, you know, again, that's the first one. But um, it's something that could be done weekly. And it's different. You know, it's just a different medium than a YouTube video. A YouTube video is something that, you know, there's less interaction. Yes, there's a comment bar on it. But, um, you know, with these, you can have, who knows jumping in you can have people you know asking questions you can have people you know debating about a stock you know what's what's the best 10 bagger potential or what's you know the best explorer for gold or silver and um you know quick background about me you know i started in gold and silver um well, i kind of you know saw some videos uh, down the rabbit hole same thing and um you know i i unfortunately i started investing in around 2010 2011 when it was uh, on its way down from that $50 spike. And, um, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but that, that, that was a really big spike in 50, that $50 level. And um, I just caught it on the way down and I kept thinking, oh, well, it's gonna go back up to 50, it's gonna go, go back up to 50. And I just really didn't understand what happened. And one of the first financial books I bought, you know, it said, pay off your debts. And um, after that, um, you know, you can start investing. So. I kind of um, really, you know, it's been a really big hobby of mine and I, um, I just, that, but that was my original goal thing was gold and silver. So um, Mike Maloney, his videos, you know, I just can't watch them enough and recommend those, you know, that, but I think that's the ultimate, you know, education right there. And he's done such an amazing service with that, with those videos. So I'm more of a silver person and, uh, you know, I have gold stocks. I like gold as well. But, um, you know, that's kind of the, the angle that I take is that silver is everything gold is and being destroyed <laughs> at the same time. And it has uh, more of a uh, more of a commodity, so more uses to, to do. So uh, that's kind of my angle on it. And I love uranium, too. Uh, I've been in uranium for a while, too. Um, but uh, I love silver. Now, I agree with you 100 percent. And it's actually interesting. Mike Maloney tweeted out the other day. He said he showed a silver round and said, hey, we used to sell these for 99 cents over spot. And it's like, good grief. Wasn't that wasn't that the good old times? I mean, I looked right now. Let's see. So. Uh, 
if you want to go buy silver right now, the premiums are five dollars. That's twenty five percent over spot. If you want to buy eagles, the premiums fifteen dollars. That's seventy six percent over spot. Outrageous. I remember I used to buy silver eagles on weekend specials. You could get a dollar fifty over spot sometimes. And now you're talking about fifteen dollars to buy an eagle. And so <laughs> You may have bought it $50, right? I think a lot of people did, but think about it. If you want to go buy an Eagle right now, it's going to cost you 32, even though the price is 19, you know, and this is, this is outrageous. I mean, if this is what's happening to the spot price right now and the premium, think about where it's going to be here in a couple of years. How much is it going to cost to buy an Eagle regardless of the spot price? What's this premium going to be? It's already, uh, you know, apparent it's going to go, you know, parabolic. And so the game is changing. You know, I used to invest, my father invests with me. We've both been, you know, stacking together, you might say. And, uh, you know, we'd have talks over the years buying between $14 and $17, and we'd complain about the spot price, and we'd complain, you know, oh, it hasn't gone up yet. I still remember in like 2015 or 2016, you know, it kind of made a jump up to like 20 bucks. We said, oh my God, here it goes. It's going to break out. You know, of course, it just fell right back down to 14 or whatever. So I've been riding this ride a long time. It's an emotional roller coaster with silver. But you think about um, buying back then, and for everything that we complained about, we didn't know how good we had it. Because if you want to get in the silver now, especially the physical, you got to pay up because these premiums are outrageous. And demand just was off the charts, especially from 2020 and onward. I mean, people were rushing to this. You had the silver squeeze. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder how that could have gone if everybody would have skipped investing in the equities like AG or buying SLV and all went into Sprott. You know, a lot of people are uh, from uranium here. <clears throat> you know, and I, I think what happens, what happens if the day comes where there's a run on the COMEX, what happens to uh, PSLV, right? You got to think that uh, uh, it's trading at a discount just like uh, Sprott Uranium is. And, uh, you know, that's a good way to, to make some gains, I think, in the long term, too. Easy to liquidate as well. But I am so bullish on this sector right now, and I am seeing so much confluence in this market. And the sentiment is non-existent. I mean, it well, it exists. It's really bad. Right? It's very negative. And uh, I think that we are trying to put in a bottom here. Uh, every indicator in the world is telling us so. And before I end up going on a rant, I'll, I'll just make a couple little notes. The commitment of traders in silver is 140,000 contract. And that's the lowest since 2020 when they sent the lows. Okay. You look at the charts on the weeklies, they're putting in bullish hammers all over the place. Okay. There's so much confluence with what's going on here on the backdrop of everything that's happening with the Fed. I'm extraordinarily bullish here. Uh, just the month over month net shorts are down uh, close to 9,000 contracts. That's the lowest since June of 2019 when we put in a major pivot low, by the way. And the swap net's up 7.4 thousand, okay? And that's extremely good. So no matter how you look at it, whether it's the breadth, the historical analog, the price itself, um, just the momentum and RSI, everything has confluence to this being major oversold and due for a mega, 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 mega rally in the near term. Yeah, and um, there's there's a lot of uh, interesting people in this trade. And um, again, talking just more about silver and there's uh, they're very accessible. So um, I don't know if you know about uh, Dezo, but um, he's um, in, he's a European. He's into uranium as well. But he. Um, He's one of the first people to really track this and say, you know, something's wrong with uh, the, the COMEX. And um, he's kind of uh, passed that on to Michael. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have him on or talk to him sooner or later. But he's kind of doing the, the legwork on tracking the COMEX. Uh, and again, uh, he, he knows a lot more about it than I do because he's, you know, tracking it on a daily basis. But uh, something is not right. Something is not adding up. And... Um, in, when something like that happens, you you can do what you know you can buy it, and uh, or you can you know try to trade it, and um, but uh, basically something is not right, and it's it just it's been like we've been the boy crying wolf in the silver community of oh it's manipulation manipulation and manipulation, but um, it's ne it's it's it just feels like it's never kind of never broken through. So the se the sentiment is is just insanely low. Like it's nothing. I'm, you know, again, 
like we're giving away like a you know a really nice coin and you know there's like almost nobody nobody even wants it or cares about it i've seen mark dice do videos where you know he he trades like a two dollar bill or a five dollar bill versus a silver coin and no one even wants you know the money so or the you know the silver so uh you know it's ultra low right now yeah, right. They'd rather have the chocolate bar. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, this first episode is going to age really well because, like I said, I think uh, the sentiment is so low at a time when people should be as interested as they ever were. Uh, there's all the correlation in the world that we're coming. We're trying to put in a bottom here. We're The, the macro situation is changing, and I think people are, are – Okay, something I've been talking about for a long time and I've really been trying to pound the table on is the Fed uh, being narrative only playing chicken with the markets. And the Fed has managed to win over the market. They really managed to, managed to win over the psychology. And people are giving them so much credit. The institution that deserves no credibility whatsoever is getting away with everything that they say and they're winning. And, you know, for now that's working, but I think pretty soon the jig is up on this thing. I think we're coming to a point, and I don't think that uh, we're going to get another hike after July. And if we do, it'll be 25 points. It'll be seen as a pivot. I think the market already realized that the Fed is running out of runway, and this, this narrative is coming to an end, especially as the market starts to roll over. Um, you're, you're starting to see things break. Uh, you're you're getting fudgy uh, market data and, and, and employment data. Um, it's it's stinky. It's real stinky out there, and I think the market smells it. And so when people say, "Well, why isn't gold higher? Why isn't silver higher?" Well, first of all, I think gold has performed extremely well to now. And on top of that, I think gold knows too. I think gold's working out the weak hands right now, getting it out of the system so it can go take that next leg up. I think gold knows. I think the gold market knows. And I think that's why you see so much confluence um, market-wide. Everything's kind of hitting those trends at the same time in the same place, getting the same kind of bounces. I think the market's getting ready to take the next leg up. And that's why, you know, I, I've come into a little extra money I didn't expect to get. I made a loan to a buddy years ago, and he, <laughs> I thought that money was long gone. And he came back and said, hey, I got your money, you know, and uh, I'll even give you interest. Like, are you kidding me? And uh, so anyway, that's kind of a little good news for me. And I, you know, I was thinking about putting in the account and buying some more equities. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I need to go back and get some metals. I haven't bought some metals in a while. Maybe that's what I should do. And I thought about maybe just getting a little bit more gold. Uh, because the prices are so low, um, you know, compared to where I think they're going and it's had a nice drop, I feel like this is a good time to make another entry, another long on physical. And I'm kind of torn because I would love to buy more silver right now, like, like you're talking about. I agree with you on silver, but the spot is absolutely killer, but the ratio is like 90 to 1. It's like, what do you do? What do you do when the ratio is so high? And then I rationalize with myself, well, if the premium is here now, where is it going to be in a couple of years, right? It might be a 200% spot, you know, at this rate. I mean, where are we going from here? I mean, um, it's like every day, you know, the, the gold and silver market, and you're seeing this in the physical market, okay, and premiums and stuff, it's sneaking up on people. It's not pulling a Tesla. It's not pulling a Bitcoin. It's just slowly running away, right? And it's becoming more and more and more expensive over time. And that's why Mike Maloney says one day it's going to be unaffordium and unobtainium. Oh, I think he might be right. Yeah, and, uh, you know, again, we're talking about how much is available per person. It's nothing. I'm, I mean, so much of the silver has been, it's in landfills. And David Morgan talks about this all the time. It's in landfills. It's, uh, you know, broken up in the ocean. And uh, it's it's not recoverable at an economic price. So, I want to say it was a fourth of an ounce or a fifth of an ounce per person on earth. You know, if this thing really got, got squeezed or um, dried up, you know, you could see really high prices with this. And uh, another thing that I would love to hear, I know you've talked about it before, Liberty, but uh, the dollar milkshake thing, theory, and, uh, you know, the dollar just keeps going higher and higher. And um, I guess it's the DXY that they measure it with. And, you know, um, there, there's talk and people saying this thing could go to 150. I mean, what happens if we go to 150? 
Yeah, it's a big deal. That's uh, Brent Johnson's theory, the dollar milkshake theory. And the short way to explain it is that the day will come where you'll see the dollar, the stock market, and gold all rise together in confluence at the same time. And the more advanced way to understand it is that the reason is because, first of all, the dollar is a world reserve currency. Okay, and because it's the world reserve currency, there's a natural demand for our dollars. And so as much as we Americans focus on the Federal Reserve and all their money printing and we make fun of the toilet paper and the fiat, the truth is, is that all of these governments and countries around the world do the same thing. And but because they're not the world reserve currency, they don't get away with it like the Fed does, because as they you know look at the yen, right? And so as these, these, uh, these countries uh, print their currencies into oblivion, they still have to go buy dollars. And so this drives up the price of the dollar because they have to purchase these dollars, right? And they have to buy our treasuries. And what this does is it lifts up the dollar. Uh, and this has happened in the past too. This is why we had the Plaza Accords, right? We The um, United States came together with Europe and Japan and said, look, the dollar is out of control. We got to weaken this thing. So they all agreed to uh, manipulate the trade to get the dollar lower. And Brent Johnson thinks that this might happen a second time. He thinks we might have a Plaza Accord 2.0 2 because this is going to get out of control. The dollar is simply going to become too strong. And as an addition to that, the dollar is really going to be the only place left to go um, because not only is it the world reserve currency, but it's the petrol dollar. And so it, it, it has all these benefits that nobody else has as all of these countries go into a sovereign debt crisis at the same time. And so as everything kind of collapses on a financial level, everybody's going to run to the dollar because even though it's crappy too, it's better than everything else, right? There's no alternative. You know, Tina, there is no alternative. Well, that's going to be the dollar. And so, so the best horse in the glue factory or whatever analogy, the dirtiest shirt in the laundry or the, the cleanest you, shirt in the dirty laundry. That's exactly right. And so his entire thesis is based around this concept. And look, he even says he only has to get about 30% of it right for it to be a big deal. And it looks like he's going to get at least that much right. Um, you know, there's still a lot of time for things to play out. Um, you know, black swans could throw anything off in any direction. But um, there's obviously a lot of validity to what he said. And it looks like, uh, you know, the euro is in a lot of trouble. And so what happens next? And the thing is, is that what happens next is not going to be good either way because these currencies are dying. So and they have so much debt. And so does everybody default on their debt or do they keep printing money and just keep the system going, keep the status quo? And I would just point you part of my investment thesis, by the way, is to point to the fact that politicians will always take the path of least resistance. The politicians don't want to go and vote and make a conscious choice to take things from you, to tax you more, especially as things are falling apart, right? Because then not only will they not get reelected, but they'll be villainized forever. And they're not going to make a conscious choice um, not to implement fiscal polity to save your job, right? To save the economy. And so it stands to reason in the confluence of history, because this has all happened before, that they're just going to choose to print more money and to keep this thing going. And that's not necessarily a good thing, right? It just means that we're going to keep the can down the road, but we're going to go through stagflation. Part of that's because of energy. Uh, there is no energy. We have a supply deficit. And so, sure, maybe we have enough oil to kind of stay where we are, but we don't have enough to grow. That's a problem. That's... You know, people talk about, well, we're going to go into a recession and demand will come down. Look, you have to bring down demand substantially just to meet the supply we actually have. <laughs> and then if you want to kill it beyond that, you're going to cripple the industry because the already non-existent, um, uh, the already non-existent, uh, uh, I'm to, oh, got lost in my word, investment, non-existent investment in the oil is going to go to zero. Right, it's going to get even lower. And this is part of the problem that you have now is that, you know, oil runs up real high and then it crashes down and nobody wants to invest in it because the run's already over, right? And so this problem isn't really going away because everybody's kind of looking at it the wrong way. And so it's kind of here to stay. And so what that all means is that since you can't grow, 
you you physically lack the supply of energy to grow okay and since we know politicians are likely going to fiscally support the status quo and to keep this thing going we're going to have stagflation so we're going to have reduced or declining growth at the same time we have persistent inflation and this is going to be a, a tricky thing to navigate and i don't think a lot of people appreciate this um, but this is why I'm so bullish on commodities. I think monetary metals are going to make out like bandits on this thing. Um, stagflation is going to be extraordinary bullish for the precious metals. And I think when we come back around full circle, this is going to be very, very bullish for commodities broadly, especially energy. You look in the 70s, you look what happened with energy, it ended up making 30% of the S&P. We're only 5% right now as a weight. So there is a lot of rotation to come into energy, into metals, into miners, and even at some point when they decide to print all this money and save the world, right back to copper, right back to nickel, right back into all the industrial metals too. Great points. And um, there was also a really good interview with George Gammon and uh, Capitalist Exploits recently. And it kind of um, is making me think a lot about, um, basically he's kind of saying that an app or if you think of the US dollar like an app or a, a place like Zoom or Twitter, it's just the default. It's the default of what we go back to, how we solve problems. And, you know, they don't know how to deal with, oh, how, how do we, how do we uh, fix the, you know, what these new currencies to? What do we, well, we've always done it with the dollar. We've always used the dollar. So um, they don't exactly under, it seems like they're, the, there's not an exact uh, way to fix them. Instead, they just have always relied on the dollar. So it's there's there might be a point where or it feels like there, there's going to be a point where it breaks later, but um, we just don't know how it's going to break. But most likely commodities are going to be involved heavily and it's going to be where, you know, something gets tied to gold, silver or commodities in the, in the future, these uh, currencies. No, I agree completely. By the way, if anyone wants to come up, just uh, feel free to request. Um, but yeah, you know, I love psychology and I especially love it in markets. It's really fascinating how many psychological principles you can apply to and see play out in just day-to-day -day market activity. And I think to expand on what you said about people adjusting, there is like an adjustment period if you were to make that kind of transition. And there's really no good way to do it. I think you have to just break it on people and say, look, this is it. And you tell them what to do. I think they did this in Germany too. I think they did it twice. <laughs> it's like, and people rolled right into it. In fact, uh, you know, there was a period in Germany when people were selling their gold for the for the currency, right? So people got bamboozled both way on this, both ways on this thing. And uh, you know, to extend on what you were talking about, um, commodities and the currency, uh, there's a lot of speculation that uh, the next currency, the next Reserve currency will be backed by commodities. Zoltan Pozar has done a lot of talking about it. He has essentially what's a white paper on it, and it's very fascinating. I think everybody should read it. Um, it's extremely good, and it's informative, and this guy's in the know. And things he says, uh, you know, carry a lot of weight, and it's very well written, but it's, it's kind of fascinating how it works, too. Have you ever heard anybody talk about how you'd pay gold again? It's like you basically just set set the price of gold at five thousand dollars, and then Jim Rickards gold, talks about it a lot. Yes, that. So you do that same principle, but you do it to all the commodities, and you you'd buy and sell and and keep them all at a flat rate um, to make them a basket of stable currencies. Yes, and uh, it's um, I went to uh, Freedom Fest several years ago, and um, uh, it sounds weird, but I actually ran into Steve Forbes. I talked to him, and it seems weird because this guy's a literal billionaire, and I'm just a guy, you know, a normal guy. But he was a really, really nice person. And, um, you know, one of the points he was making is um, every time we dilute the dollar, we are changing the scale. We are changing the uh, the measure or the means of measuring and weighing. You know, it, this is a uh, criminal. It, it's just criminal at times to think, oh, well, we can uh, change or we can our goal is 7% inflation or 6% inflation. Like who gave that person the right to uh, raise 
the cost of everything by 6% to every family. Like who, who gave them that right? And they, they just feel like they have that ability to do that. Um, another, another thing I want to uh, talk about Liberty is um, where you think is the best value now too. So something to kind of think about in a minute is uh, like, what are you, what's best platinum, gold, silver. Uh, so uh, I want to hear from you about that too. It feels like silver, honestly. I <laughs> How many people have said that over the years, but it, it does feel that way. Um, yeah, it feels, I think we've gotten to a point where silver is becoming asymmetric. It's already so oversold. So you look at the commitment of traders like we had talked about earlier. Uh, you have to go back to 2020. Listen, you look at the charts on some of these miners, silver and gold, by the way, and the breadth of the sell-off and the distance from the 200 moving average on the weekly, you have to go back all the way to 2014 to find correlation, which was, you know, the end of 2014 was when that, uh, this current run started for all these equities. You know, a lot of them really took off there. You look at Newmont 2015, right at the beginning. You have to go all the way back to there to find the same correlation. Um, if not, then it's right there at 2020 at that uh, COVID sell-off. And so everything's extremely oversold and it feels asymmetric. Um, you know, in the metal space, we always understand the financial situation and we're always looking forward to the printing and the decline of fiat currency. But now that everything is sold off so much, it does start to feel a bit asymmetric. Um, there does look to be, you know, a little bit more downside maybe, but I'm not sure how much it could be. Uh, <laughs> I mean, these things are sold off. Um, you know, we really appreciate how asymmetric uh, uranium is. And that has a lot of structural reasons behind it. I think that makes it, you know, technically a better trade than gold and silver. But I think if I were looking for uh, upside in the metals, it would definitely be silver. Um, I don't invest in platinum too much anymore, honestly. Um, even the physical platinum that I owned, I've sold. Um, you know, I bought my last physical ounce of platinum in uh, 2020, and I got it. I was watching the trend one day. I saw it sell off down to 850, and I hopped on JM Bullion and I bought it right there. And it was a $150 premium. It cost me a thousand dollars for that 850 dollar, you know, ounce of platinum. And I ended up selling it, uh, you know, about 1100 after it after it had came down from 13. It's like I made a hundred dollars on a forty percent move. You know? That's one of the things too is uh, when I, and again, um, there's nothing wrong with you know getting a physical stack, but it's it has diminishing returns. Where you know, again, I don't keep it in my house; I have it in a bank. But you know, the liquidity of it, selling it, um, you know, you really want to have you know all these bricks hanging around. Uh, so, I mean, in the silver community, there's some people that say, you know, it's criminal to to buy, you know, this stock or that stock. And like, you should only buy the, the bars. But, you know, both it's both they're both fine, in my opinion. Get get a, And I, I'm with Steve Penny on his his point of view is, you know, start off with a stack, get a decent little stack. And then after that, you know, go for the equities. But, um, you know, I, I want to hear too, Liberty on uh, as far as the silver companies. I um, do you like streamers, explorers, uh, the majors. What are you look? What are you looking at? What are you kind of measuring? So uh, I'm in a lot of uh, developers and producers, and I got a couple optionality plays too. Um, you know, I really like to get into the big names first, um, and then I kind of branch down into the smaller caps. Um, I actually do subscribe to, I'm always subscribed to at least one newsletter at all time. I tend to rotate in and out of them and I try everybody. I really like, I really enjoy seeing what's in everybody's newsletters, right? So I, I just give everybody a turn one after another. And I have one that I've always kept. And so to be honest, I've gotten a lot of my due diligence uh, from some pretty good newsletters. And, um, you know, once I have those names, I have taken the time to go check them out for myself for there, uh, but it takes a lot of time. And to be completely honest with you, uh, if you can you can afford just a, a one-term subscription, whether it's the monthly or quarterly or semi-annually, however however their newsletter works, 
I think it's worth it to try a couple for one term and to see what's in there because some of these guys have some really good picks and they have really spent a lot of time finding these gems um, because, you know, the gold and silver space is not like uranium. But there's a lot of companies out there and there's a lot of landmines out there and there's a lot of good way to lose everything. I mean, I have watched uh, several companies just completely plummet. Look at what happened to Arcana. That was like the golden child, Arcana Silver, and it has totally collapsed. Um, you saw Rio collapse recently. It's down 80%. It's not their fault. They didn't get a permit, but, you You're know. You're Rio Tinto or which one? No, nah, it's a smaller It's a smaller company. It's um, ticker R-I-O-F-F over the counter. But uh, they collapsed 80%, you know, and maybe one day uh, they get that permit. Maybe right now it's a great deal, but it's going to be, you know, dead money for a while. But, uh, you know, it it helps having people whose job it is to do this for a living. But the trick is, is that, you know, anybody can put a bunch of stocks in a letter and sell it, right? So you have to kind of do your own due diligence on the people themselves and kind of have your own discernment and discretion within these, you know, within these choices you make. Um, but to be honest with you, that's kind of how I do my uh, gold and silver stocks when I'm looking for the big winners, right? Is I I pay up. I pay up and let other people do the work for me. And once I get that list, I'll go flush it out from there and and verify it for myself, right? And see what I think about it with my own gut. But those lists I've become, I've come to learn are invaluable. I mean, they really are kind of worth it. And I think most people kind of stick around in the newsletters because most people want kind of guidance in the markets, but really just when it expires, go get another one, honestly, to see what everybody has to say. Yeah, and uh, I'm, cu I'm kind of curious too about streamers though. I'm, I'm big into those, or um, I guess they have different names, streamers or um, royalties. But, uh, yeah, you know, from uh, from, I guess one point of view is that they can, you know, they've got everything locked in and uh, they they lock it in at a certain price. And during a bear market, they can just go out there and get great deals. They and they have low and like they, they have a low amount of employees. So they only have, you know, four or five people working. They just are kind of like the sharks that. uh I don't know. I don't know about a loan shark or something, but you know, they, they just, they can, you know, make the best deals when the market's dead. And, um, you know, they do have, you know, sometimes a premium price, but, um, you know, it seems to me that they can be a lot safer, uh, and less risk averse because they're so spread out. Yeah. Uh, I agree. And a lot of them are on sale. I, I really like, uh, Metalla. I've been looking at those guys and, uh, I've looked at them. I don't own any though. But if if and when uh, gold makes a sustained bull run here, and you break two thousand twenty five hundred gold and it's up there, then yes, it does stand to reason that the uh, royalty companies are <laughs> going to make bank in good times and in bad because they are quite literally going to be rolling around in gold. Um, you do make a very good point that they probably do have very high upside that's also very sustainable in all in all conditions yeah and uh, i have a really big position in sandstorm and um, that's one of um, jason Burak's, uh wall street for main street one of his biggest picks he, he talks about it all the time and uh, steve penny also they did an interview recently and that's one of their top picks but uh, again do your own diligence um, and of course i'm in it but um it's just it seems like it's hard to go wrong on that one and especially because they have copper they have copper royalties too so um you know, it just seems like that one's e an easy uh an easy pick to kind of just stick with and uh, forget about so you had mentioned you keep uh, all your metals in a bank huh so how does that work i've never used a resource like that uh bank or uh, relatives houses uh, different things like that <laughs> so um, oh, i got uh, you right <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind of spread out here and there, but I don't go crazy. How, like you're, if you break into my house, you're not going to find that much. So just say that. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a, uh, a bullion depository in Austin too. So there's a little bit there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been okay. They don't, they don't charge too bad of fees, but um, you know, again, my stack's not that big, but um, I, I did get a little, um, I don't know. I fell into the fever of it with silver and 20, 10 or whatever and i was you know going around telling everybody hey you got to do this you got to buy this buy this buy this and uh and it was one of those uh 
They they say that it's better to get you know beat up early. So if you know, I I I um I put like two good paychecks into Doug Casey's new newsletter, and it was just bad timing. So I, I uh, put two solid paychecks into it. It went about 10% up. And I thought, hey, I'm doing well. Look at me. Uh, the, then it crashed by 70%. And it, it was just the market. And I didn't understand any of it, why it was happening. Just, hey, I thought this guy was supposed to be telling me the good ones. And uh, it, it, it killed me. But it's so good that it happened early on. It happened early on so that you can really uh, recoup that mistake and you know kind of pick up the pieces afterwards. So. Uh, I want to hear about those two, Liberty. Uh, I'm sure you've had a few um, uh, early lessons. Let's just call them that, early lessons. Yeah, I did. Um, but before that, uh, I want to touch on something you said, you know, uh, about the newsletter. Lobo Tigre, we, you know, everybody knows him. He's a great guy, and he has a free one that he offers out. And uh, he published it just a few hours ago. I read it before we came on. And he actually was willing to post one of the questions that he had had. Uh, from one of his subscribers. He said, look, one of our best buy picks is down 60%. And it just goes to show, you know, like everything, everything's down and there's risk in everything. And even the best of the newsletters, you know, they, it's not like uh, there's a, some secret pick out there that's doing well. I mean, you, you have to do your own due diligence and you gotta, you gotta wait this thing out and play the markets correctly. And Lobo Tigre, by the way, he's been pretty hands off. Okay. He's been the guy that said, you know what, I don't want to buy anything right now. I'm going to sit on my hands and not do nothing. Right. But in this most recent newsletter he put out, he's kind of like, mm, it's tempting. Right. So I think everybody's kind of starting to identify this inflection point we're coming up on. Um, so it's very encouraging. Uh, a lot of the big names are all starting to see the same kind of signs in the market. Um, and what was it that I was going to comment on? Uh, early lessons. I'm just kind of curious. Oh, man. Well, I don't know how relatable this is, but uh, when I was trading crypto, um, I was doing it on Kraken. And that particular exchange, this was in 2017, that particular exchange, you couldn't set stop losses. Okay, so the only way that I could get a notice that my trade was going in the wrong direction if I wasn't looking at it was to actually use TradingView. And I would set up a line on the chart. And once it crossed it, it would send me a text or an email saying, ding, 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 you know, you're... You're losing money, buddy. And um, I set up a leverage play one night before I went to bed. And what I'd do is I'd set up my computer with the speakers up really loud, right? And it would wake me up. It's not a problem. So if I knew I needed to get out of position overnight, it would wake me up and I'd do it. No big deal. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but that's kind of the game I was playing at the time. <laughs> as ridiculous as that is, right? Because I couldn't set up any other way to do it. I had to do it manually. Well, I set up a pretty big position one night and Bitcoin tanked to that night. Right. And I had my speakers muted and I didn't get the alert. And when I woke up, it was gone. All of it. All of it. And uh, I lost a I, I lost a lot of money that night. And it was for no, you know, I knew I wanted to get out if I lost that level. Right. But I just didn't even have a chance, man. It was gone. It was just just like that. It was over. And, uh, you know, it was a leverage play. And I learned a very expensive lesson that night more than one way. Right. And it, the whole story is kind of silly to have done that, you know, but hey, man, that you just kind of get wrapped up into it and you're on a roll and you get cocky and, you know, then you lose a lot of money. Yeah. And um, I don't know what it is, but there's just nothing like those crypto cycles. And um, my goodness, I, I've been through two of them. And this isn't, you know, too much about crypto because, uh, well, I'll ask Liberty, too, about it. But um you just get swept up. I mean, there's tons of uh, silver and gold people like they're analysts and they're uh, jumping into the cryptos too. I mean, it's just nothing like that euphoria, that mania of, you know, a photo of an ape or an NFT that just has no value. And yeah. It's, it's just, um, uh, I don't know. It's just, I, I've, I've been in there. I've been swept in and into it. I, and I knew it was a trade. And uh, I, I did well. I did very well this, this cycle. But um, it just it, it keeps you on your edge all the time. It's like there's some new little thing coming out. And there's some little, like, there's, there's always some new person that you know, comes out of nowhere, some new coin. or uh, it's, it's just, it, I, I really feel you on the madness of that. that uh, like, it's, it's like traders, either heaven or hell, either one. But um, 
it, there's just nothing like those cycles. But I, I guess my question is this, though. It's um, out of all the coins, I mean, is this just a big waste of time? I mean, is, are, do we just, are we just turning our computers, bumping them around? I mean, what, what problems? It just doesn't seem like they're solving a lot of the, the real problems, a lot of these coins. And... Yeah, I agree. The, uh, you know, the common phrase is that they solve a lot of problems that don't exist. And I think for the most part, I agree with that. I also, don't, I'm not sure that it's sustainable, especially as we go through this energy crisis. So we, you and I kind of talked about this in the uranium chat last week, but our electric bill just doubled. And I don't know if anyone else in here can testify to, you know, if you signed up with a new contract, a new electric provider lately. But we did. We came out of contract and we had to get a new contract. And our electric bill doubled. It went from eight cents to 16 cents. And, uh, you know, if anybody, maybe my neighbor's not paying that much right now, but he will, you know, as soon as his contract comes up. And so what happens to all of the miners? You know, a lot of these miners came to the states uh, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, I can't imagine that this is a, a Texas issue and that uh, energy rates are simply going to go up. And so what happens to the miners, these Bitcoin miners, when their electricity prices double? You know, your uh, your incentive costs go way up. I mean, I, it's, it just doesn't seem sustainable uh, for now. Uh, it, it does feel like it's going to drop quite a bit more. But, however, even though I don't believe in this stuff, even though I don't like it, I mind it. I mind a lot of Ethereum. Um, I lost a lot of it on that trade we were talking about, right? I lost a lot of that wealth, gone in a single trade. But I was mining Ethereum when it was 20 bucks, you know. Um, actually, if you ever heard the story about the guy who traded 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza, I was actually mining Bitcoin at that time. And I quit that day. My buddy came in the room and he said, dude, you hear about the guy who just sold, you know, 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. I was like, well, what the hell am I doing this for? It's like I'm getting, you know, like a hundred of these things a day. <laughs> you know, it's like, what am I even wasting all my time and all this crap? You know, it's like, you know, whatever. And by the way, I don't have those. They're gone forever. You know, I was like, I was young. I had a gaming computer with dual video cards, right? I had two 59, uh, excuse me, 5850s. Uh, really cool uh, gaming rig back then. But then they happened to be the best video card to mine Bitcoin with back then. Anyway, I quit. You know, it's like, well, what, I, what the heck? What's this wasting time? This stuff isn't worth anything. Um, but anyway, I don't believe in the stuff, but I've been involved with it many times. In fact, I've even flipped video cards on the side. I had a nice little hustle during this during this last bubble, right? Uh, you know, I, I had a way to buy all these video cards, and I had no problem flipping them for a profit, right? But <clears throat> thing yeah. is, the thing is is that when the Fed pivots and starts printing money, when when they institute QE5, I will absolutely buy Bitcoin. I might even buy it with leverage, and I'm not joking, because it's probably going to skyrocket uh, for some time. Now, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, I feel like Peter Schiff's probably right. You know, it's going to go to zero, or a lot of these things are not going to exist anymore. Um, but I do think it has legs for one more run. Yeah, and uh, it's a very interesting thing, and uh, I know in the history books are going to have you know chapters on it uh, <laughs> later on, and uh, it seems like it's either one or the other. It, it either solves these massive problems, or it's just this like nothing. It's just this giant circle we walked in for nothing, and uh, it, it's uh, definitely something interesting. But um, as far as also, um, I know we got some uranium people in here. Uh, do you think uranium is a good trade relative to gold and silver, or it's kind of in the same category, just in that same energies and metals? Well, I think uh, uranium uh, is structurally more sound. I mean, it has real supply and demand problems. And like Rick Rule likes to say, you want to flip the light switch and the power come on. And so that's a lot more meaningful uh, in this, you know, um, than uh, monetary issues and inflation driving up the price of gold, for example. Silver is an industrial metal. Its time is coming. I do think they're going to try to save the planet with this massive green agenda, and you're going to need more silver than we have under the sun. They're going to burn through this crap. It's going to go parabolic, right? Um, yeah, and, and the but, thing is that once it's burned, it's 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 done. You can't. I mean, you can kind of recycle it here and there, but it's very difficult to recycle it at an economic price. So it's kind mm -hmm. of interesting because in uranium, Twitter hates solar. They hate it. They're like. Uh, this is the worst, but then the silver is kind of like, well, 
I mean, you, it's uh, over time, you know, because it seems like the, the panel prices keep getting cheaper and cheaper and to the point where, you know, it'll be economic at one point and you have to have that silver in there. So, um, you know, I, I'm kind of torn on it where I, 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 I love the silver part of it, but then, you know, the Iranian people hate, hate solar in general. Yeah, and see, silver is tricky for that reason because of its kind of dual mandate, you might say, right? It's it's monetary on one side and it's industrial on the other, so it rises at the worst times and falls at the best times. It's so stupid, right? It's really infuriating metal. Um, and so to the degree that we're going to need it and uh, we'll have a supply shortage is uh, fundamentally probably true, but it's not part of the narrative yet, right? It's just speculation. And it's for that reason, I don't think it's really taken off or done much. Um, but I think that the what appears to be an imminent bounce here in gold, um, you know, it, it, it'll ride with it uh, as a monetary metal. But, you know, it might not really take off until um, that narrative comes where we're going to need all this silver for um, all this uh, all this infrastructure that we're going to build and all this green tech and all that kind of crap. Um, so for that reason, you know, I think uranium is a safer play. I think it is. Um, more fundamentally sound um, in the more immediate term. I mean, in fact, uranium <laughs> uranium's getting a little infuriating too because it's like a, it has nothing but positive going for it, um, but the market's uh, not appreciating that yet. Though it does seem apparent to me that the market knows, right? The market knows. The market understands uranium. The market wants to be in uranium. That's why, you know, it hasn't collapsed, right? It's held this trend line, these bull trends for months. You know, it's like it, it just doesn't want to give them up. And I think that's a testament to the strength uh, of the market. You know, uh, these are buying opportunities, I think. And, uh, I, you know, I'm accumulating at those levels and I'm happy to do it. Now, I think most of the money in uranium is actually going to be made on the technological side. So you're in your uh, enrichment and, uh, you know, whoever wins out on that. I mean, Silex is having a clear bull run. It's it's going ballistic. I mean, it's the... Um, SILXY ticker, it's almost doubled in just a couple weeks. You know, it went from like uh, six bucks to 10 bucks. I think Chapman, yeah. Chapman got that one right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I found uh, shovel stocks uh, when the bad news came out about LEU. And I sold LEU about 46 bucks. And I actually made a video about uh, what um, shovel stocks had said but I didn't invest, right? I started looking at the charts. I started talking about it. I started saying, hey, you know, if you're interested in LEU, maybe you could look at this too. And then I kind of stopped talking about it. And um, man, I wish I, I missed that one. But uh, when it comes back down and all things eventually do, you know, I'll jump in there and grab some for sure. It's on my short list. And I may have mentioned it already before in the uranium one, but um, as far as uh, like, what is your strategy as far as uh, stop losses or do you have to watch it every day? The chart, I mean, are you just like hunting the chart, looking at it at the computer screen all day or do you just set it and forget it with a stop loss? Typically the short answer is yes, uh, I, I, I watch it, but for the last several weeks, uh, I've been on the road a lot. I've been setting up new territories. You know, I've been in Tennessee and Florida. I got to go to the Carolinas next week. It's it's been busy, and so my schedule's been a bit different than normal. But the short answer is, yeah, I'm usually at my desk with the computer, and I eyeball markets on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't like stop losses because uh, people fish for stop losses, and I don't want to be the guy who uh, sells, uh, you know, for a day or two and have to, you know, watch it rebound on me. I, I would just prefer to see the move, see if there were any, you know, any volume behind the move, and evaluate it. Uh, and then make a decision from there. Stop losses make sense for a lot of people, but not for me personally. Um, I like to manage it and, and look, I've been talking a long time about Cameco breaking $20 and that'll be a, a critical point. You know, if it breaks $20, it's, it holds serious risk to the downside, but I'm gonna hold if it does, because I wanna see how that daily candle closes. It might close on a hammer. Right? Just because it breaks twenty dollars, right? I I want to see stuff like that. I don't want to get stopped out of stuff like that. Does that make sense? For sure. And I want to hear too about uh twenty twenty during that March, that just insane panicky time. But we'll, uh, I'll tell you what what happened with me. But um, you know, I want to hear about you too because it it uh, I was uh, again uh, I was mainly in uranium, 
but I was in there really big, had some good positions. Um, and it's not that the stock's that great, but I just kind of knew the price of it and it was fission. And, uh, you know, I had it around 50 cents and Bob big, you know, thought, Hey, this thing's going to two bucks, two bucks easy. So, um, you know, watched a little videos on YouTube and whatnot, but then, um, it crashed down to 24 cents and I thought, okay, let's get more, let's get more. And when that COVID crisis happened, my God, it was like, there was just, everything was on sale and there was not nearly as much, um, uranium, uh, feedback or gold or silver feedback. It's just people were, they didn't know if the half the world was going to die. It was just total chaos. And, uh, you know, oil was negative or it seemed like oil was negative at that point. So, um, I, I actually, it sounds insane, but there's a, a COVID anomaly bottom that I caught on fission and I just knew the price of it. So I was like, okay, let me just load up. But, uh, I caught it at nine cents. <laughs> like, well, I, I don't think I'll that. ever do that again, but I caught and like a bottom on that one. And, uh, part of me just like never wants to sell it. Cause I just like, Oh my God, look at this. I have to keep this as like a trophy, but uh, I want to hear about what you were doing during that crisis, that uh, whatever you want to call it, that March of 2020 level. Yeah, so I was actually all in cash. Uh, I was uh, talking to my friends about it. My friends all made fun of me about it because I was a conspiracy theorist. It's like, look, man, do you understand? Because I would watch the Who reports and uh, I was like, <laughs> I was even watching that Steve Lickner guy on YouTube for like a couple of weeks, uh, listen to the updates because it became clear watching the videos coming out of China that something serious was coming. And uh, I think obviously, however it started, it ended a lot different. But at the time, this was a novel thing and there was a lot of uncertainty because we didn't know what it was or what it would be. And that equals uncertainty, that equals fear. And so it was obvious that a, a market sell-off was coming. And so I wasn't in anything. I didn't buy uh, I didn't participate in the market, but I did buy precious metals in the sell-off. Um, the only real uh, good deal I made out with uh, on stocks was uh, United States Steel. Uh, I got that at 777, and that did me pretty well. Um, I, I'm actually going to sell out of that and rotate now. Um, I should have sold it when it was higher, but I don't know. I just didn't do it. Um, but I'm actually about to use that and sell it and rotate back into, I don't know, either uranium or silver. But I, I just bought metals. I bought a lot of physical metals during that time. So a, a particular uranium or silver stock you're looking at, or uh, how are you? How are you picking them out? Yeah, again, uh, I get a lot of my picks from uh, uh, some news newsletters that I feel very, very strongly about. Um, one in particular I've been with for a long time. That's uh, Jordan at the Daily Gold. I uh, really vouch for him. I think he's very good at what he does, and I think his research is very good too. And like I said, I you know I've never subscribed to Lobo or anybody, but I'll probably check him out next time. But what I do is I'll rotate. I'll buy one, and if it's monthly or quarterly or whatever, I wait for it to run out, and then I just go get another one, and then I just go get another one. The one that's on sale right now, and I wish every uranium investor, I keep nagging him like release a video, release a video, is North Star. North Star and Bad Charts. I want to get really? Bad Charts. Yeah, like oh my god, like they 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 have a really good sale. I highly suggest them. Um, but uh, I mean, it's nothing but charts, and to them, the chart tells everything. And um, um, North Star is a um, meteorologist, professional meteorologist, but it's very scientifically approached as far as you know what the trend says. They don't do any any uh, diligence on the on the. Or it seems like they don't diligence on the stock is just what the chart tells you and they have uranium and silver both just like going through the roof i mean like it makes any uranium investor look like you cannot find anyone that's more bullish on uranium as far as except for his charts and you're just like what this guy like because he's he's so rational um at the same time but uh, i mean they're just like going through the roof i mean really going through the roof so um, I really like him. And of course, I, you, you can't just say, oh, well, this guy, this guy has the, uh, he points the arrows in the direction I like. But, um, you know, he, he called Bitcoin, like, amazingly. He called it on the way up, on the way down. And, you know, that was one of the points when I said, get out. He just said flat out, get out at 40,000. 
when this if this thing doesn't turn around you need to get out right now so um you know we, i see some other people joining in sometimes these things start a little bit slow but if you guys want to jump in kind of talk a little bit about investing um it's not uranium specific but more gold and silver but i see some uranium people here so jump in if you want to you know, I will say that uh, Bitcoin, if you're looking to get your feet wet in technical analysis, uh, Bitcoin is a is a great place to do it because it plays technicals really well in and out, which is interesting because a lot of the Bitcoin community dismiss <clears throat> technical analysis so handedly. It's, and that really infuriates me. That's uh, part of the reason I kind of wanted to come on and, and make a channel and stuff because I feel like people are throwing away an extraordinarily valuable tool, and I feel like uh, – if I do my job right, then I can I can prove its value. And I, I, I hate seeing investors, especially young, impressionable people, younger people come in and just completely throw away a tool um, that's so vital, that can be so vital to success. Um, but crypto is a great place to do it. You just look at the current chart of Bitcoin. You get the double top. There's a head and shoulders. There's a white cough. There's a pair flag. It's like it couldn't have been more obvious. I mean, it's going to be in a textbook one day. If you make a technical analysis textbook, like to teach people TA, then, you know, the last year Bitcoin is going to be on the front page. I mean, that, that's it. It's like you could not ask for more clarity than that. And so, yeah, it does not uh, surprise me at all that he called that because uh, it was clear as day in the charts. Um, but I'll check into those guys. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll pick you up really on good, that. Uh... They have a really, really good special, and they do an hour-long video. Like nothing, they 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 do like almost every uranium chart. They'll say like this is where you know weekly candles. Look at all this, and and I'm not a technical trader, but I I'm I'm just I'm slowly getting more convinced and more convinced that there's something through this. There's something through this where it's it it other people can you know trade on it and make decisions. So I mean there has to be something to it. I mean, these the charts and the patterns are there. They've always existed, but um, I mean, he, you just I, I just can't recommend him enough. But it it still seems like he's under the radar, even, especially in the you know the gold and silver uranium community. Uh, but he does them all. He does cryptos and, and everything else. But uh, and a question I have for crypto too, uh, Gareth Soloway, He made such an amazing call. It was at sixty, and he said like at least twenty and maybe twelve. So. Um, I don't know if you have an opinion on how low it can go, but, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people saying 12,000 could be a low here. Yeah, I think he's uh, spot on. If you look at the chart from uh, below 20, then you have 14, 12, and 10. And uh, if that uh, supporting trend line holds at all, then it'll probably be 14. Um, but, I, you know, it's it, the, the support's clearly stepped down, and uh, you can look at the volume historically to see um, – what kind of support each price level had. And so, yeah, I, I see what he sees and I understand it entirely. Um, something is coming. Something is still left in the wings, I think, to bring us, to give us another drawdown. Um, in fact, I kind of use Bitcoin over the weekend to see how the markets might open. It's kind of a leading indicator, honestly. Um, but it, it stands to reason that we're going to have another drawdown and how long it may take before we get it. I don't know, but I feel like, um, Something is – it's already baked in the cake. Maybe it's this electricity issue we talked about. It could be a whole host of things. Um, but uh, I, I do think that it has to go down there, and it probably will. I'd agree with him 100%. Um, again, I'm – for Bitcoin, for me, the charts are important, and I'm going to keep looking at them. But really, it's the Fed. Um, Bitcoin trades with the Fed balance sheet. That's the, that's all you need to know. You can make two trades, buy and sell on massive macro moves. When you hear that the Fed's about to start printing money, go buy it. It's just as simple. Whatever the price is, it, 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 whatever the price is, it doesn't matter. Just go buy it that day. And when you hear rumors of any kind of tightening, then you sell. And that's that's the way you play Bitcoin. It's just that simple. So as far as technical analysis, though, how how did you learn? Is it through videos, books, or what do you what do you think is the best resource for someone that, uh, aside from just uh, having someone else do it for them and saying, "Yep, they did that that chart." Yeah, I think uh, the most important thing in technical analysis isn't even the charts; it's understanding the difference between fundamentals and reality, and being able to understand what narrative is, and being able to understand how this how this all works. And uh, that way you can filter out the noise. And once you're able to filter out noise, 
you can apply reality to the charts. And uh, on this fundamental backdrop of the chart, um, you can start applying technical analysis. And at first it's very simple. It is just lines and triangles and stuff, right? But um, beyond that, uh, you can grow. I mean, there are some good resources like Gareth Soloway. You can subscribe to him. He's probably one of the best, right? You can follow his work. Um, you can spend years and years and years just reading about it on your own. There's plenty of resources out there. Uh, you know, uh, read about Wyckoff and uh, all these uh, already existing patterns and, and concepts that exist out in the wild and market psychology. And, um, you know, it's, it's complicated. I don't know what what I did is I just spent time researching it on my own in my free time. I just, um, you know, and I got a lot of practice in crypto, which I think was good for me because um, despite that extremely bad trade, like I told you about earlier, um, you know, everybody's a genius in a bull market. And I got a lot of uh, practice uh, trading and swing trading in crypto and crypto plays technical so well that I just had an amazing confirmation bias, seeing it always work all the time. And so that was uh, very good for me personally because it gave me conviction and confidence to play those things out when I saw them repeat other places. And I think that's part of it too, is confidence and conviction and really in anything, even in my videos, I'm always kind of pounding the table on being confident. It's because if, if you're not confident, then you're kind of wasting your time altogether. Uh, you got to be confident in what you're doing, why you're here, why you're doing it, and where you're going to end up, and uh, you know why you like the price right now for what it is, and um, act on it. You know, because if you use technical analysis to say, "All right, this is twenty dollars, and when it gets to sixteen, I'm buying," and then it gets there, and you're like, "I don't know, now it looks really scary. This is a fishing line. I'm the, what, what are you even doing? It's like you wasted your time. Why even?" Do it in the first place if you're going to change your mind at the last second. You got to have confident conviction to act on your plan, and I think that has a lot to do with it too. Is having a plan for sure. And uh, Rick Rule has a saying about uh, don't confuse uh, bull markets for brains. And uh, he actually, uh, I, I think I maybe I, I told either you or Chapman, but he started doing these spaces too. So um, he did his first one. It was either Palisades or Michael. Um, this other guy that does like every space, uh, but uh, he's he started doing them. So, um, you know, the goal of this is to really get, uh, you know, something consistent and um, where we have people that we can bring in later, because uh, before you know it, I mean, with their, an example is their uranium one. I mean, um, I kind of just, you know, started, you know, throwing, it was, you know, dust in the wind or whatever, just saying, Hey, what sticks? And let's just start talking to people. And it, uh, before you know it, it can become, you know, uh, really big where, um, you know, you have a CEO come in. Um, so it's not, um, it, I, I really think if something like this stays consistent and is weekly, then, um, you know, it'll be, you know, this will be the spot. So this will be the hangout spot. So that's what, um, you know, I want to do. I think Liberty wants to do that is, you know, we're talking about, uh, uh, coins. We're talking about stocks. Uh, what's the pin bagger? What's the explorer? What kind of thing uh, excites you about it? But uh, you know, again, we gotta gotta start off and uh, just shoot for it and see what happens. So I want to hear some other people too in the room. If you're uh, investors, like what got you into it? How how long have you been in, into it, Frank? If you have anything to say, Robin. Uh, so if anyone wants to step up, you know, just kind of jump in a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, too, if you could uh, respond to the question with a, a heart emoji or something. Like, uh, how many people in here um, own physical metals? Just curious. Already own physical metals. Gold, silver, platinum. And one? Okay. Well, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I, I've been uh, stacking metals for a long time, many years now. And... Um, you know, at, at first it's a little daunting because you don't know where to start. Um, I give you a place of reference, though. Uh, sometimes my friends will ask me, well, how much should I own? And I think, you know, the common answer you get is it's based on your wealth and all this stuff. But I'll, I'll put it to you a different way, give you something to think about. You take all of the gold that's been mined that's on the surface of the earth, okay, and you distribute that evenly between every living man, woman, and child, and everyone will get about one and a quarter ounce, okay? 
just call it an ounce. Everybody would get one ounce. And if you take only the bullion, okay, the, the coins and the bars, and you distribute that evenly to every man, woman, and child living, then everyone would get three ounces, okay? So if you just start with an ounce of gold, you already have your share of the global gold wealth that exists on the surface of the earth, all right? And if you get anything more than three, then you have an excess of your share of all the gold in the earth. And I think that um, kind of changes the picture for a lot of people who feel daunted about how much gold they should have that, you know, a little bit of gold is uh, a lot more than you might think when you think about it that way. Have you ever read the, the book or familiar with the concept of the fourth turning? Yep, yep. So, um, and they, they don't, the guy, the, I think it's, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he, um, you know, he talks about, you know, we're going through the turning, it's going to last another 10 more years, and we're in the middle of it, but um, it just, it seems like so much of it's related to money, and who has the power to create money, uh, and how, how that's divided between other people and wealth. I mean, it just feels like it's becoming more and more obvious. A, a lot of the, the problems we're having, the energy crisis and everything, it's, it's all tied to money and the wealth disparity. And you hear you know, people from all kinds of different sides saying, well, look, we can just cut this up a little bit more, cut this up a little bit more. But um, it just feels at the end of the day, the people who have the power to create the money is just being diluted and it's uh, just the, it's not a sustainable way. Yeah, you're right. It's uh, William Strauss and Neil Howe. I'm actually holding the book right here. I went in my room and picked it up. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, you're right, and I think that's why, you know, gold, getting into gold, getting into precious metals really is kind of like a, a white rabbit experience because once you get involved, you go down the rabbit hole, and you start learning about so many concepts in finance that you might not have gotten into before, one of them being central banking and fiat dollars and debt-based monetary systems. And once you understand these things and how money actually works and that it doesn't come into existence until it is borrowed into existence, you walk into a bank, they don't have the money. They don't have the money until you borrow it. And then it just gets made up in the account and they give it to you with interest. You know, and once you start understanding this stuff, it uh, really changes your opinion on, uh, on how everything works. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a bit of a red pill for people. And uh, it's all important. You know, this kind of crap should be taught in high school. You know, at least to to an extent, and I think most people get out of high school and they can't, you know, figure out an interest rate. You know, it's like uh, it's 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 very unfortunate that you have to put in so much work and personal effort just to figure out how our financial system works. And then when you do, it's it's uh, feels pretty gloomy. For sure. So I'm kind of curious too, um, as far as uh, people that you'd like to bring on. You think maybe more CEOs? I mean, well, maybe later, but see, like uh, companies, um, investors, other investors. Like, uh, so uh, you know, I, I think some of the top people I would love to uh, talk to are like Steve Penny, um, uh, Don. I think it's Don Durrett. He he has a list of uh, stock, uh, gold and silver stocks that he he does. Like these are the five baggers. These are the ten baggers. Uh, I want to get him on. I would love to get um, Mike Maloney, of course, but again, he's uh, up there. Um, but um, Jeff Clark, he works with him, so uh, he's he's some of my top goals. So again, if this if this can stay consistent, those are the people I want to hear from. So Liberty, who who would you want to hear most from, as far as uh, you know, either a trader or a um, investor or you know maybe a company person? I agree. I I. Um... I already want uh, Jeff Clark as well. Uh, it would really be great to see Jordan from the Daily Gold, uh, maybe even uh, you know North Star Charts, get some technicians in here, um, some macro guys in here. I think between technicians and macro guys, I think I feel like those would be the best for right now. Of course, man, if you get some really good silver picks right now, I don't know, that, that might be pretty good too. I feel like uh, you know we're we're in a buy zone. I think we're in a buy moment, and so that's some pretty good information, but. Um, yeah, I've reached, I've reached out to Bad Charts, and uh, I, I, you, you just have to get on there, right? Uh, uh, right now, they have a special too, and it's, it's not that expensive. But uh, Bad Charts is like one of the biggest, like, uh, 
I and I remember when the silver squeeze. I want to hear about this too. But like there was kind of the, the when the silver squeeze, it felt like oh this thing's gonna happen. This thing's gonna happen. Uh, it was kind of right when maybe it was twenty twenty one or nineteen or yeah I think it was twenty twenty or twenty twenty one. But the silver squeeze, it became like hey this is gonna happen. It's gonna happen. We're gonna break the vaults and everything. And oh my god, he was just he was over the moon. He was just going nuts and uh, changing his profile pic and everything. So um, did you, did you uh, whenever the silver squeeze thing was happening, were you buying or were you, uh, what were you doing exactly during that time? Yeah, um, I was watching. Uh, I think at the time uh, I didn't have any available cash. I regret not selling AG at $24. <laughs> Sick. Uh, but um, I was watching with the hope that it would actually happen, right? I didn't sell anything because I was really kind of going for the, for the whole thing. I was like, oh my God. Because another thing that, you know, I would try to talk to friends and family about is the whole Comex situation. And, um, you know, after, because this started after the GameStop thing and everything, right? And so these Redditors broke the the market, right? And these couple of equities. So yeah, it gave De validity. De and Dezo, uh, hopefully we'll get him on, but he, he was the one, he, he was the main one that broke that, that narrative as a, his, uh, Kier, his, his real name's Kieran, but uh, Dezo Gamer is his uh, tag he goes by. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's funny because I said, man, you know, I was in a group chat on uh, uh, WhatsApp with my buddies. And I was like, man, you know, if they ever did this to Silver, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> so they were like, oh, ha, ha. Well, sure enough, they tried to do the Silver Squeeze. And uh, one of my buddies bought AG at like $23 too, man. He did. And I think he still got it. But uh, – I was just holding on. I, I mean, I was just waiting to see what happened if it played out. And um, even in retrospect, if you look at the chart, uh, it had three gap opens that sold down, and that was a hard sell signal. I just don't know why I didn't do it. I was just really hoping that uh, it would actually pan out, I guess. I just really, it wasn't even about making money. I just wanted it to be exposed. You know, I was really, really hoping for that. I've been waiting for that for a long time. I want these suckers to. Don't get exposed for all this crap, all this fraud in the market. A seat you know? at the table, they say. That's right. That's right. So, uh, yeah, I wrote it out. I didn't sell anything. Um, I just, you know, I just watched it. Yeah, I kind of, uh, I, I don't know, I'm sure someone could dig up some old tweets of mine, but uh, I kind of fell into the uh, trap a little bit, and I got way overzealous and excited about it, and uh uh, but uh, yeah, I went I went way into it on Twitter at least. But uh, it felt like it was happening. That little Ron Paul meme of like, uh, it's happening, it's happening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it felt like it was gonna be um, the moment. But uh, and I I can't put my finger on it. If someone else wants to chime in ever, but uh, it just seems to have faded. I mean, it, it was hey, this is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. But you if you tweet, you know, silver squeeze, nothing happens. There's just a few people with it hanging there uh but it's just it doesn't feel like it's it's uh, has any momentum at all yeah i think it's because people realize how hard it would be to pull off you know it takes a lot of liquidity and a lot of organization and um you know i think after the first one fails you know you, you're demoralized and um i don't know it's even uh uh wall street bets even doing anything these days anymore other than posting all their losses i mean do they even accomplish anything anymore yeah and it, it's been a really interesting thing because um i've been an investor you know kind of digging around in markets and labbing on about it to people i'm stuck at work with you know being the uh, that person and uh it just it during that march of 2020 millennials did not invest they did not invest it was seen as this oh uh you know that's what uh rich people do or that's what you know this other person but that something about that that being at home or being on lockdown where that's when the you know the they just jumped in the market they they kind of you know that's when the wall street thing bets took off so it's just um it just feels like mania where you know people are trading options that don't know what they're doing and, and i don't trade options because i don't know what i'm doing with it but you know trading options that they don't know and you know watching some amateur guy tell him oh we'll buy this coin and you know it's it's just um it's just a mania cycle and uh it just seems like that really started or that as far as 
the the psychology of it. It started in March of 2020, where um, you know people could just they were stuck at home. Yeah, I think you know the word. It's the psychology of it. And I think what might have happened is you think about the way the world looked back then, okay, in this COVID crash. And people were stuck home. There was a virus. You couldn't go to work. You pe- Businesses were shutting down. But the stock market was on fire. The stock market was going up and up and up as everybody lost their job. And so I think the psychology did change. I think um, people said, you know what, that's obviously the place to be. They always get bailed out. The stock market always goes up, so I'm going to start putting my money in there. And I, I think that that's what did it. And uh, in fact, I think uh, part of the macro that we're living through right now has that same psychology behind it. So with people kind of maxing out credit cards and they're still living beyond means as inflation's going up and up and up you should be more frugal but people are kind of over stretching themselves i think again the psychology has changed i think people say hey we actually got a bailout for once we we'll probably get another one again right um <laughs> this is the danger of all this fiscal policy and, and loose money printing money like this and now that it made it out into the people yeah i think that their psychology has changed too I think people kind of expect to get help when things uh, really hit the fan. And I mean, not to get too political and not to say this or that party, but how do you run against somebody that says, I'm going to give you free checks or stimulus? How how are you supposed to run against that? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. That's, it, it seems like the uh, the average person is waking up to this, though. I think, uh, you know, inflation, it's like they say, it's the economy stupid. I'm not sure that these people can promise anything and get away with it now. I think they're on their way out. Um, I'm not sure how many gimmicks that they have uh, left to stay in power, but uh, I think that the populace is, is obviously growing pretty tired of the situation and have a lot of buyer's remorse in the current administration. And uh, suddenly those mean tweets seem kind of good, even though, to be fair, you know, Trump was responsible for, for a lot of this inflation, too. Right. And so it's not to say that uh, he didn't have a part in it. Um, actually, you know, you know, uh, what Trump did best was he exposed things. It's not that he even exposed things. Just his existence caused other people to expose themselves. And part of that was with the Fed. And because. You know how many people I have to argue with that the Fred has two mandates, and this is all they do. This is all they care about. Well, Trump proved that wrong because the Fed wanted to raise rates, and Trump came out in public and said, can you believe this? They want to raise rates. They want to make the cost of money go up. Obama got all this cheap money. Now that I'm in power, they want to take it away, and they rolled over like dogs. They rolled over like dogs, which just goes to show that the Fed is not independent. It's a political institution that answers to the White House. I don't care what you say, he proved that. And so, um, which is really makes it interesting to me that this meeting with Biden and Powell and Yellen, they all came together to talk about what? I mean, it's really curious what they would have talked about because you see that uh, Biden is throwing the Fed under the bus Okay, saying this is their job. They're, you know, they got to get this under control. But then you see Powell go in front of congressional testimony and say, like, look, these are things that I can't control. <laughs> it's like, so it's curious the dynamic that's playing out. I don't know if there's that much division in the administration and these people aren't getting along or if this is some kind of a, you know, 3D chess move play that I'm not seeing yet. Um, but something's going on for sure. And it is interesting to watch it play out. We got uranium cranium. Jump in if you want to. Oh, I'm content to listen. Uh, but I just I do want to just uh, you know voice what everybody's probably thinking, which is I can't believe I live in a country where the former central bank leader is now responsible for you know issuing the country's debt, and you know you know believably would have an inside line to the current to the to the to the, you know, the heir to that position. I mean, I, I scratch my head and I think, you know, with, with QE and the, 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 the idea that money is issued by treasury, gets bought by banks, gets sold on the secondary market to the central bank, 
and goes there and just you know it's it's like this shell game and i'm like i i, I scratch my head i'm like is you know is this still like the the same country that i was thought was told was legit because it's it kind of is it feels really weird that the central bank president sorry the central bank chairperson can then in their in their immediate next function become the treasury secretary and be responsible for issuing the shit that the central bank buys and wants yeah, you're exactly right. You're 100 percent right. I mean, we're corrupt. We're corrupt as hell, and we're not just corrupt, you know, behind the scenes. We're corrupt out in public, and they get away with it, you know. And it's really our fault. I mean, there's nobody to blame but ourselves. You know, we, um, you know, we allow these people to come into power, and you know, um, uh, one of the reasons I, I tell you what, I'll tell you something. You see, um, I mostly talk about markets, but you see, my name is the Liberty Offensive. I actually had something different in mind when I made my YouTube channel. I was actually going to be about 70% political and about 30% markets, right? Um, because my intent was to make somewhat of a clarion call to action for people to uh, be offensive with their liberties. As I've developed a philosophy over the years, it's a working philosophy that uh, the best way to defend liberty is with proactive persuasion rather than a reactive response. And I think that the reason that we're losing so many of our liberties is because we wait to defend them. We have been brainwashed. And it's like you hear it on the TV. You probably heard it from your grandparents that, you know, you defend liberty. You defend liberty. It's a good normal thing to do. But look, entropy is a natural law, right? Things are always breaking down. You have to put in effort and work to maintain whatever it is you care about, whether it's your home, whether it's the dust on the floor, your family, you have to put work into whatever it is you care about to maintain it. And this is no different with freedom itself. You don't defend liberty, you offend it onto other people. That's how you do it. Because for every person that you offend, two others will be inspired, right? They will, they will uh, aspire to have that kind of freedom too. There are plenty of people in the world who like, I don't know, Maybe I can go outside and mow my shirt with my mow my yard with my shirt off, and maybe that offends my neighbor. But there might be somebody else in another country, you know, who would see that and say, "Man, I wish I could do that." Right? They don't have that freedom. So, for every person that I offend, you know, I'm in, uh, inspiring other people, and really, it's it's irrelevant. You, pe we've become too afraid to offend other people, and as a consequence, we've uh, been quiet, we've been mute. And in that silence, a bunch of radical, crazy people have become very loud, and they are filling up the void with a lot of noise, and they're getting their way because they're being the loudest. And uh, I think that that's our fault, too. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff never would have happened if we were more loud and offensive with our liberties, right? They never, never would have even attempted it in the first place because they knew that they would have been met with opposition. But just thinking about it rationally, if you defend liberty, then by default, that implies that someone is already attacking your liberty. That's why you're on the defense in the first place, right? It's better um, to be on the offense, especially historic historically, all these battles for freedoms and liberties are won on the offense. Even our founding fathers, right? They had to throw crap off a boat and catch stuff on fire to get their freedom. You know, this is offensive. You know, freedom is inherently offensive, and um, I think people have the wrong mindset about about that. And uh, you just have to be emboldened and encouraged and confident enough to speak your mind, whatever it is. And uh, don't let anybody say that you're crazy. Whatever it is you believe, just speak it and speak it with boldness and conviction. And uh, don't be suppressed in whatever you do. And you should be very, very, very bold with yourself. And so uh, be inspired to uh, you know offend others with your freedom. Well put. So um, you want to focus more on finance, though, on your channel, or what do you, what do you see it as? Seventy percent finance now, or <laughs> yeah, I made one, one, well, one or two more political videos. I made one about Russia. Um, you know, I tried to point out that uh, this was a big uh, narrative push too. I tried to show the context of uh, this Russian invasion, and uh, you know, 
so I made one about Russia, and then I made one that kind of outlined the thesis that I just talked about. And I used a lot of uh, references in that video, like the Ash experiment, the Hope experiment, things like that that help outline the things that take place in day-to-day -day activity, the things that you see the media portraying against you, for example, or government officials, for example. Um, you know, these things are, um, look, it's like if I know about these psychological principles, believe me, they know about those psychological principles and psychology can be weaponized and used against you to manipulate you. And this is, you know, that's exactly what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And to a lot of people, that sounds crazy, but it's true. And it's very easy to prove it too. And I give illustrations of this and I try to break down and show you uh, how it all works. But I guess the short answer is I've only made two videos like that. It's just for whatever reason, better or worse, I've just focused on the markets to this point. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't really have an answer. It's just the way it's rolled out. But that wasn't my intent when I started the channel. When I started the channel, it was to be more political and then have an aspect of finance in there too because the only way to truly be free is to have financial freedom too. And uh, I'm personally, I'm debt free. And I've been debt free for a while and I'm very proud of that. I'm, you know, I'm like a newborn baby. I have less that debt than a newborn baby. <laughs> Baby's born owing money. It's like, yeah. uh, and, so, and, you know. and it really, it really boggles my mind too to think that, um, you know, in the 1800s, you know, 1820 to 1860, uh, maybe not 60s, but there was there were time periods, there were decades when you could have buried cash in your backyard, could have buried it, and your grandchildren could have opened it or your children could have opened it and had the same exact purchasing power. They would have bought the same, you know, wheat or corn or whatever else. So it's just frustrating that it's this game that we're going through where you know there's dilution. You're going to get diluted and you have to, or it feels like for me, that you have to just jump into these markets that are, you know, all over the place, bonkers. And, you know, there's all the trading things going on. There's the, the charts and everything. You have to do that just to keep your head above water, just to keep the same purchasing power. And it's, it's uh, it just feels like, why, why do we have this? It's, uh, it's frustrating a little bit. Yes, and uh, I agree. Um, first, that's why I like precious metals so much is because, you know, you can take the uh, silver content and a mercury dime, right, pre-65, and it buys the same amount of gasoline now as it did then, right? Um, ebbs and flows a little bit, but it tends to be true over time and because it holds its purchasing power. It's money. Gold and silver are money, and they do their job. And so we may be a little uh, upset sometimes that they don't go up more faster, but they're doing their job. And you look at what's happening to gold and silver and other currencies. It's like going to all-time record highs. I mean, these countries are nuking their currencies, right? They're printing them in the oblivion. And this is why we come back at the beginning. We talked about dollar milkshake theory. This is why the dollar is not falling like that, right? Because it has all these benefits that those currencies don't. So they're printing into oblivion, destroying their currency. Gold and silver are skyrocketing at all-time new highs. All right, and we're still trying to get through this correction in the dollar. Uh, but that time is coming because those are just sneak peeks of where we're going. And if you want evidence of this, this is part of my investing thesis, by the way. Like what's happening in Sri Lanka, right? When they're breaking down the gates to get to their bank, that, that central bank. Listen, you don't think that uh, our government and our banks don't know how that works. If I was able to predict that, now you see it playing out in all these places. Of course, there's nuance to why that's happening. But look, they have two choices. It's a deep, deep recession, if not depression, to stop this inflation, okay, where you will get something like that in America, or you do what empires have always done in history, and you just deflate the debt away. I know they're going to do that. I know that's what they're going to do. You look at Jay Powell and uh, Elizabeth Warren in that congressional hearing. I mean, she was begging him to stop raising rates because she would rather have inflation than people without jobs. And so you know this is where they're going to go with it. And so as frustrating as it might be, this isn't stopping. This isn't going away. They're just going to print more and more. And uh, this is going to be life now. Remember, and there's historical analogs to this and, and what we can kind of expect to happen. Like when they did it in Germany, they reinvented their currency like twice. <laughs> you know? And people sold their gold 
to get into more of the new currencies, right? Because they they wanted to cash in. It's like so people got bamboozled all along the way, and uh, it's tricky. This is going to be very 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 tricky. Uh, but and I guess the thing too that it's um, you know I can navigate it. I can figure it out. You know as far as well better than the average person can. The thing that really frustrates me is that you're doing that to the average person. The average person should not be managing their own money. They should not be, um, you know, watching, you know, three hours of YouTube channels on how to uh, invest. They should, you know, or, or, I mean, in theory, the average person should be able to uh, not spend their time doing that. They should be doing what they do best. If you're, you know, a cobbler, I don't know. Uh, if you're a computer person, you make computers. If you're, you know, uh, uh, whatever you're, vocation is that's where you should be spending most of your time on and it just feels like as much as it's important for people to be financially educated there there's so many they're going to get left in the dust that's the frustrating part of this is that you know there's going to be real big winners but most of the people are going to get left in the dust yeah i mean we've eaten the fat and calf i mean all, all the best beats gone and so um you know we got to make our way around the bone now and uh you know, until the next animal comes along, basically is what's, what's going on here. And so this is the, uh, the end of the system. And, you know, the thing about right now, when I first got into gold and silver, I couldn't buy enough. It was like, I got to get it right now. The current dollar's going to die tomorrow. Oh, my God. I only have like, oh, you know, 50 ounces. Geez. And you realize over time that this, these cycles take a long time. This is a huge engine. Okay. And then this is not just here. It's global. And these, these things take a long time to play out. Um, but a testament of the benefit of preparing in advance, even if it's not necessarily so imminent, is like we talked about at the onset of the show. We talked about the premiums on silver, for example, right? Where <laughs> you used to be able to get an ounce of silver, a silver eagle, $1.50 over spot. Now it's $15. $15 premium, 78% premium. And so the cost of preparation is going up and up and up and up. So if you want any kinds of hedge like that, um, you know, the cost is going up. Even if you wanted to buy something like those 20-year uh, uh, food supply storage things, right? Cost of those are going up like 30 40%. Everything's up. So the longer you wait to prepare, the more it's going to cost you in the end. And that's why, you know, those who are patient and just – uh, have the foresight to be prepared are going to make it out the best because when everybody goes to react later, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard and expensive. Not to say you won't be able to get what you need. It's just going to cost a lot, right? And you're not going to have as much as you could have. And so you don't have to be scared. This isn't fear porn. It's just a uh, mental prep. Understand what's coming and prepare for it, you know, maturely and responsibly. Yeah. And Doug Casey has a kind of a line that, um, all of the assets, all of the wealth is still going to be there. The buildings are going to be there. The, 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 the cornfields, the wheat fields are going to be there throughout this, uh, whatever you want to call it, the shift or change. It's just the owners of those are going to shift. So you want to be on the right side of that uh, whenever that shift does happen. Yeah. And I'm, I'm playing this thing all the way. I actually sold my house. Uh, we're renting right now. Um, so I'm, I'm playing that aspect of the market too, uh, for better or worse. We'll see what happens. Um, but I'm being pretty bold about this whole thing and, uh, you know, thankful, thankfully, um, I'm just in a position where I could do that. I've got a supporting cast all around me. I've, you know, great family. And, um, but I'm going all in on this call, I guess, uh, of the future. And, um, I have a lot of, I just... I just know in my gut that it's the right thing to do, you know, so I'm not taking it lightly. I'm not living in fear, but I am preparing for what I think is inevitable. And hopefully I can take advantage of all those assets that are still going to be there, like you say. And Yeah, and I, I do a little bit different with um, with real estate because it is a commodity. It is a commodity. Um, or in certain places, it's gone up to, you know, crazy levels. Yes, it's gone up, you know, insane. But um you know, where I'm at, the prices were low enough that, you know, if you get a big mortgage and the currency is, you know, getting uh, diluted, you know, you're, you're whatever, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars you owe on that house, 
it's not going to, it's going to be a lot easier to pay off over time. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's something I do, but again, it, it really depends on your location because I, I bought like, it's just, they're just so dirt cheap. The houses I have that you, I mean, people would just think like, it's not believable, like $67 a square foot, $70 per square foot. Um, and these are not dumps They're you know, they're decent uh, fourplexes, but um, you know, again, another way to look at it. So I'm kind of of the opinion that real estate, you know, there might be a bump, but um, you know, that's something that you want to be in also. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the thing is, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about ho housing, um, people simply being priced out and more cost on the way. And so especially a lot of the people who bought houses recently, their mortgages are already going to go up because they have prices, uh, excuse me, they have taxes that have not even been factored in yet. And the home values have gone up so much, like here in Texas, uh, they can only appreciate 10% a year on taxes. So there's years of tax increases baked in. And so, uh, you know, people don't buy what they can afford. They buy what whatever loan they can get, you know. And so people are already kind of on the margins, especially in a tight market where they had to pay a high prices. And I'm fearful and expectant of uh, people having trouble. Like, look, our electric bill just went up, doubled. Our electric bill doubled. And then you have that on top of your mortgage going up because your taxes are going up because your asset is appreciated and your grocery bill is up and all your costs are going up. It gets to the point where you're going to have to pick and choose things. And I'm just worried that a situation like that may, may cause trouble for the housing market. Um, obviously, it'd be better for people if that doesn't happen, but I do kind of expect that to happen. And if it does, and kind of the rest of my positions play out the way I expect them to, then I won't really care what the interest rates are at that time, right? Because it's going to be on the cheap, then I'll have the cash. But uh, that's kind of my strategy of how I'm playing that. Yeah, and my longer term strategy is, you know, if I win big on gold and silver or uranium, it's uh, go back into housing. Because uh, the area I'm at, it's, uh, I live in South Texas, but um, it's, um, you know, you're going to, you'll get good prices. And I do uh, fourplexes too, so they're rentals. So you know, I can bump the rent down fifty hundred dollars and still rent it. It'll always rent. Um, you know, there's yes. always going to be a rental market somewhere. So it's it's a different thing with housing. But uh, I do only a fourplexes from there. Just uh, if you don't mind speaking to it, did you have any issues with uh, you know permanent? Uh, what do you call them? The renters who wouldn't leave? Um, not really, and that's a fear. The squatters. But, um, you know, again, it's um, you, there's risk in everything. There's always risk in um, in any stock, owning anything, owning, you know, uh, physical bullion, owning any anything. So that's the big risk with it. But at the same time with housing, you get some benefits, too. You um, you know, you paint your house, deduct that you can deduct this. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Um, but, um, most of my money is in housing. Um, but, uh, I just, I, it's not exciting. It's not, it's not going to get like, uh, I don't want to hang out with like housing people and talk about drywall. It's just nothing fun about it. It's just where you park your money. That's it. So, um, but again, right. you know, it's, it's a big thing for me. And, you know, part of the theory on it is, Hey, you know, you're with, if you get a big old mortgage, it'll, you know, if the currency devalues, you'll get the interest paid off, or it'll it'll be easier to pay off over time. But have you noticed housing prices? Uh, I don't know if you're in Houston area, right? They've just gone yep. up to like crazy. Yeah, <laughs> through the roof, man. I can tell you right now, nothing, nothing about the house I own was worth that much. Nothing, and I just didn't believe it. I I just felt like I I was the one getting the deal to sell it. Um, that's just my personal feeling. I just, I just felt like it's a huge bubble. And, you know, I, I'm in construction. I'm involved with multifamily. And we have projects uh, all over the country. We've got 50 projects right now all through the southeast. And so I have direct firsthand experience with housing, multifamily housing. And, man, it, it is absolutely exploding. I mean, we have so much work, so much work. And people are constantly, constantly calling for more, more, more work. And uh, what I've noticed is that, you know, a lot of these projects are, are still being delayed. I mean, we had delays during the, the height of the pandemic, right? Uh, but now we have delays too, and they're different. And, uh, you know, some of the clients 
Um, I don't know if this means anything yet, but um, some of the clients, uh, you know, are net 30 have turned into 60 and the, the projects have slowed down quite substantially. And, uh, you know, they're not getting uh, some material. They're not getting flashing and waterproofing or even concrete. And um, sometimes, you know, you can see things like this as little signs. Um, but what I can really say is, <laughs> dude, it is absolutely exploding, especially in Texas. Uh, Florida and the Carolinas and even Georgia, I mean, they're, they're building these things like hotcakes. They're just absolutely piling them on top of each other. Because people are and moving in to these uh, they, states. That, that's right. They are. That's where they're all, everybody's moving is to the southeast. And I think that's part of why Texas energy grid is suffering. Everybody makes fun of the Texas grid. It's like, oh, you should be part of the federal system. It's like, no, it's, everybody's moving here and nobody prepared for this surge of millions of people to showing up. Freaking 110 degree Houston heat. For sure. And, um, but I mean, it, it, and my uh, dad is also is involved in housing and it's just insane where you're getting um, people at like having to ask for over the price or I don't know. It's just, and these, mar the, 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 you get these huge bubbles and it's just, you, Insanity. I mean, you have lines of people waiting to see a house in other parts of the country. And, uh, you know, it, and with the money, with the wealth effect, you know, if you have someone with the, that equity in their house, they're going to just, you know, act a lot differently, act a lot differently, spend money differently. And so it's almost it's, it's just kind of tied into the economy, too, where, you know, if, if um, you know, if people are feeling great and confident, then they're spending more money but you know if the housing prices go down and there's stress and fear that's when um you know you get the people not wanting to spend money so um i, I think you said in one of your videos too or mentioned that um you know you think there's going to be a shift or a reversal where um there's going to be more inventory but people just are going to be not wanting to buy or kind of a fear in that i, I can't remember you said that right Oh, yeah, that's the bullet effect. Um, so when the supply chains break down and you can't get the things you want, you're on a waiting list for a new refrigerator, whatever it may have been. We've all experienced this over the last couple of years. Uh, you go up the supply chain or down the supply chain and everybody kind of steps up their orders a bit. And by the time this all flushes out, uh, you know, you end up with too much supply. And all of the supply ends up at the retailer, and they've really just got to dump it. They got to get rid of it. I mean, inventory is money. It takes up space, room, and opportunity. So they got to dump all this stuff. And so there are specific things you'll find deals in, not broadly, um, but specific things. Specifically, uh, I think furniture uh, and some appliances. Uh, but yeah, these things are are coming in mass, and uh, it's, it was supposed to start after the Fourth of July when all this inventory showed up steep steep discounts and i think that this is going to be negative on earnings for a lot of retailers going forward too because they're going to have to dump all this inventory at you know break even if not losses and so you already kind of have more negative earnings baked into the cake for some of these retailers remember what you saw on target remember what you saw on walmart and they just tanked overnight 20 percent, right and so you're going to have another round of that um inevitably it's kind of already baked in the cake like i said but on the inverse, you know, on a positive note, there's upside baked into the cake, too, because, you know, oil companies are going to have earnings and uh, those earnings are going to be great. <laughs> you know, And I think there's still a rotation to come when uh, people get more confident in energy. I think the problem with energy is that people are just scared, you know, because oil goes up, it gets toppy, it crashes, and then that's it. And it's done. You go into a recession and everything sucks. Uh, but I think this time is a little different. This is a structural problem. And uh, I think when people start figuring that out, you will have a rotation like we had in the 70s where the S&P went from 5% weighted to 30% weighted. And we're 5% rated right now. And why wouldn't you want your finger in all those earnings and all that free cash flow and all these great dividends? Companies like EOG, what a great company, you know, and <clears> – <throat> You know, especially these shale companies, really premium shale companies like EOG, they've got 10 years of shale left on premium acreage. Their best acreage has 10 years left if they don't increase production. And that's part of what they've done, too, is they said, look, um, we're not just going to rape this thing. We're going to we're going to flow it out over time. Y'all don't want to invest in more in the future. So why are we going to rape our assets today to bail you out? And so, you know, that's they have a lot of time left in them, I think. Uh, 
you know, in this pullback, there's some good opportunities coming if we choose them carefully. And you have oil stocks as well, or how many? Or if you don't mean, if you know. No, I don't, man. I, I had EOG for a while. I got a good buddy of mine that's in oil, and uh, he actually turned me on to EOG, and it's been an absolute killer. But uh, I sold out of it. Um, I, I haven't bought back in, but I'm looking to buy back in. And um, I've got some on my watch list. I, I want to own future oil. That's what I want to own. I'm actually doing my own due diligence right now, trying to find future oil. All right, because today's oil is all well and good, but I want to own the oil rights of the future, and I want to invest kind of in the long term. Yeah, so I'm trying um, to figure that out. One of the and I re I really like Chapman. Uh, he's in the uranium spaces a lot. He's not here tonight. And goodness, they went four hour. I don't know four hours, four and a half today earlier. But uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, one of his stocks that he likes a lot in the oil is a uh, rig. It's like an offshore driller. So um, I've got a small position in that one, but um, it seems interesting where, um, you know, it's um, where um, they're offshore. So, I mean, you don't hear anything about that going on. So, um, and uh, based on the yeah. earnings and everything, so it's, it's an it's interesting play. I'd have a small position. Yeah, there's a company, Baytex. Um, this is a golf play. Uh, they got a lot of oil in there that's that's waiting to be tapped. I follow Josh Young on Twitter. He seems to be a pretty good guy in the in the oil industry to follow. Um, he's got a lot of good insights, and, um, and they actually started having him on uh, like CNBC lately. So he's kind of taken off in his own little world there. He is actually kind of jumping in and out of the uranium spaces. I've seen him, and there's a weird thing where there's overlap between the Canadian oil people <clears throat> and. Um, Energy Burrito seems to, um, he kind of, he's kind of like the link in there, but he's, uh, um, it's kind of like the thesis is a little bit uh, in there, but it's, it ca hasn't quite hit, but I've seen him jump in and out of there. And uh, Cuppy too, I'm sure you know who he is, but he uh, was in one of our uh, uranium spaces. So I was like, that had me over the moon. I was like, oh my God, this guy's in here. Like I've looked up to him for so long. Yeah, I've heard Cuppy talk about uranium in the past. It was months ago on an interview, and, uh, you know, I think one of his single largest holdings in his portfolio was uh, Sprott Physical, and uh, he was very bullish on it. And he didn't get into any other miners because he's not an expert in uranium, so he just took the asymmetric trade that he identified in, in Sprott, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, a lot of people are still learning about this as bullish as it is. There's there's still plenty of people who are figuring it out. And uh, I, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're seeing. I think, you know, like I said, I've said this, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Everybody understands the potential here. Everybody understands um, the current fundamental situation, the structural energy crisis that we have. And the answers that uranium provides to a lot of those problems, and even the technology in uranium, like small modular reactors and enrichment. I mean, I'm really impressed with the technological aspect of uranium more so than the, the minor plays. Um, I think that those have a very bright future. I mean, you can go to a coal plant and plug up an SMR and just turn on the power with nuclear just like that. I mean, it just feels like a, a big deal to me. And, uh, you know, I just think, like I say, people are just waiting to feel a little bit more confident. You've just had a 50% sell-off, 40, 40, 40 to 50% sell-off, and people don't want to lose another 25%, you know, and just, so people are just waiting for a signal. People want to feel easy, and uh, I think that that's all it is. I think the, once the money comes into the sector, I think there's so much room left to go. I, I don't think that, uh, um, I don't think it's close to over yet. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me in my mind, knowing what these governments are about to do next. They're just about to blow the lid on this whole thing. You know, they're going to need an excuse to print, and they're going to save the world. And uh, green energy is going to be a part of it. And now with the, the EU taxonomy, I mean, it's all green lights. Everything's in place for this to just roll. Just roll. But I mean, what if it, it – it seems like – what if it can't? I mean, what if not everyone can have an electric car? It, it, I mean, isn't this thing – it seems like part of it is – might fail or is destined to fail though <clears throat> well <clears throat> you still need base load and if you want to get rid of coal you got to replace it with something you got to replace that lost energy and so um you know there's there's plenty of uh, demand in nuclear just to replace the existing things that we don't want and so 
uh, I, I'm not sure that that's a problem. I do think what might be a problem, well, I think it might hold uranium back, will be the lack of expertise to get all of these new plants done at scale. So let's say we decided right now, okay, let's start going to China, right? Let's go build a hundred and something plants right now. You know, we just don't have the expertise. I don't think we have the engineers. I don't think we have the contractors to do this. You know, I don't know how many we can do at once, but it can't be that many. Um, I think that there is a talent problem and that might slow growth uh, globally, you know, and I'm not sure about that, but uh, you know, I, I think that that's probably true. And I see that as a hindrance and, you know, it may be a good thing. It might give uh, uran the uranium sector a nice steady burn, but I do see that as a problem. That makes sense to me. All right, uh, we've been going to almost uh, <clears throat> two hours. So um, if anyone else wants to jump up, talk a little bit, we're mainly talking about uh, gold and silver, um, macro kind of stuff. Uh, we talked a little bit about uranium, but, you know, jump in to let us know who you are. Uh, we're interested in that. Uh, Liberty, I don't know if you had anything else to say or how much longer you wanted to keep uh, going. No, that's good. Uh, if nobody else has anything to say or ask or we can we can call it good. So as far as the coin, um, so I'm giving away a coin. I kind of wanted to start off with the, the kick. So. Um, Liberty, if you don't mind just finding um, or we can look through all of the tweets on this. So if you're in the room right now, just add a little tweet on the bottom of it. So every tweet, uh, whatever, if it says, you know, milkshake or gold or whatever, that'll be the number. And then um, if you don't mind, Liberty, you can just do a random number generator. So it doesn't seem like we're in cahoots or I don't know if anyone would think that. But uh, so it doesn't seem like we're in cahoots. And then um, after that, we'll find the person whose number it is. So if, if you're the second person to respond, then um, you'll be number two. And um, we'll just find the person, then I'll reach out to them and uh, kind of say on the top of it who was the winner. Does that sound good? So does that sound good to, uh, again, Liberty, you're going to count the many, the whatever, the amount of people on the tweets. So it could be like 20 or 30. And then you're going to do like a random number generator and you just uh, post at the end of it, like the random number generator hit five or seven. And then um, I'll reach out to that person and then give them the, uh, the coin. Yep. Got it. Sounds good. All right. So we'll kind of work on figuring out, uh, you know, regular times for these, but again, we want to, you know, get it kicked off and find, um, you know, good people to interview my um, metals, people, minor people, you know, maybe get some CEOs on later if possible. But, uh, you know, Twitter spaces are going, growing like crazy. So we want to, um, you know, be ready for it. So everyone take care and have a good uh, rest of the day.